Good afternoon. The first item of business today is consideration of business motion 12525 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a revision to the business programme for today. Could I ask any member who wishes to speak against the motion to press the request to speak button now, please? And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 12525. Moved. Thank you. No member is asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, I will now put the question to the Chamber. And the question is that motion number 12525, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 12523, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, on a suspension of standing orders. I would ask any member who wishes to speak against this motion to press the request to speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move the motion. Moved. Thank you. No member is asked to speak against the motion, and therefore I will put the question to the Chamber. And the question is that motion number 12523, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are. Therefore, we move to the next item of business, which is portfolio questions on health, wellbeing and sport. Question number one, Annabel Goldie. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking in response to the petition signed by over 7,000 staff, patients and members of the public demanding adequate parking and public transport at the new South Glasgow hospitals. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robson. There will be 2,500 spaces available when the hospital opens and a third multi-storey car park due for completion in 2016 will provide a further 1,000 spaces. In addition, NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde has applied for planning permission for a further 600 temporary spaces until the third multi-storey opens next year. A range of travel options are being promoted, including car share, park and ride and public transport. The new hospitals will be accessible by bus, with 50 buses already serving the site on an hourly basis, and the site is five minutes by bus from the Govan subway station. The Scottish Government is also investing up to £40 million in the new Fastlink scheme, which will offer direct transport from three main sites in the city centre, Buchanan Bus Station, Queen Street and Central Station, to the South Glasgow University Hospitals campus. Annabel Goldie. Deputy Presiding Officer, this new facility is iconic and it is a beacon for Scotland in the delivery of health care, but very serious concerns have emerged about the inadequacy of both public transport and car parking provision. And much of what the Cabinet Secretary refers to is still to happen, and yet by June there are expected to be 10,000 staff on this site and unquantifiable numbers of visitors. And frankly, all the Scottish Government has offered us is rosy procrastination. So why has it allowed this crisis to develop and what is it doing about it now? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I agree with Annabel Goldie that this uh, new hospital uh, is going to be iconic and a beacon and one of the, the biggest hospital sites uh, in Europe. In terms of uh, the work that's been going on, a lot of work has gone on between uh, Greater Glasgow and Clyde and the City Council. Uh, the application for the 600 temporary spaces is with the City Council and we hope that they will expedite that so that that can be put in place. In terms of residence parking, there is an issue there because the residence parking scheme that the Council are consulting on doesn't start until October. So we have uh, asked that some thought is put urgently to what happens between April and October and whether some kind of temporary uh, residence parking uh, scheme can be put in place. Uh, so Annabel Goldie is quite right to raise this. I understand the, the feelings of staff about this. We have been urging Greater Glasgow and Clyde to enhance our communication with staff around what the options are, but we need to make sure those temporary car parking spaces are put in place urgently, and I would urge the Council to get on and do that. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. A number of members have asked for supplementaries. Can they be kept brief? And I might be able to call everyone a call. Ken McIntosh. Uh, I would thank the Minister for her answer. She gave a very impressive list of parking facilities and transport links. Does she believe that once they're all delivered, that will solve the problem? Cabinet Secretary. Well, there's certainly been a huge amount of work put in to the planning of transport around this. And of course, Ken McIntosh will be aware that the, the focus has been on having uh, enough private car parking spaces, but also to encourage people to use public transport options. And that is, of course, a balancing act. 
A huge amount of planning has gone in, and Geisha Glasgow and Clyde and the City Council are, are confident that what they have put in place will suffice. But of course, we need to make sure that the temporary spaces are there, because I think that is important before the new multi-storey car park opens in next year. And I think there is still work to be done on the residents' car parking, because as you know, human nature being human nature, if people start to park in a particular location and there is no parking restrictions in place, then that can become custom and practice. So we have to make sure that the council puts something in place until the residents' parking scheme starts in October. Bob Doris. Thank you, President Officer. Can I declare an interest in asking my supplementary? My wife as a nurse will be translating to Southern General in the next, the next few months. I recently met with Niall McGrogan, Head of Transport for NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, and raised with him specific issues that nurses on shift work uh, who cannot carpool and car share will lose out with disadvantage in relation to the permit system. I have made these representations to NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Could I suggest the Cabinet Secretary may wish to do the same, and at the point of permit parking for locals, the Cabinet Secretary was aware that Glasgow City Council was given £750,000 to bring in parking regulations, and hope Glasgow City Council would not charge residents £50 to park outside their own homes. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the Scottish Government arranged a meeting uh, this week on the 2nd of March, which included representatives of NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, Glasgow City Council, Strathclyde Partnership for Transport and Health and Transport officials. All parties are fully supportive of the new South Glasgow Hospitals project and are working together to ensure that suitable travel arrangements are in place. Uh, I have some sympathy for uh, what Bob Doris was saying about the residents parking. I think there needs to be clarity there. I know there is concern and there was a very uh, well attended public meeting that residents uh, were at and I think there has to be uh, reassurance given that there will be something in place uh, even as a temporary measure before the residents parking uh, scheme is implemented from October onwards. A brief question if possible and answer, uh, Patricia Ferguson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Chief Executive of Greater Glasgow and Clyde recently asserted that staff lived within, all staff lived within a one hour journey time to the Southern General Hospital. Many of my constituents would require to take at least two buses, if not one other mode of transport, before they even got to Fastlink. So if the Chief Executive of Greater Glasgow and Clyde is so out of touch with where his staff live and how they will travel to the new hospital, does the Cabinet Secretary have confidence that the plans put in place will actually serve all those members of staff and patients who will require to use the new hospital? As briefly as possible, please, Cabinet well, Secretary. We've made it very clear to uh, the Chief Executive and the Chair that they must ensure good communication with staff around all of the options. It's not just public transport. There are car sharing options. There are park and ride options. And, of course, there is the, the private car parking provision being made as well. But I certainly will reiterate the point that Patricia Ferguson has made to the Chief Executive because it is important that there is adequate communication with staff around their travel options and we will make sure that happens. Question number two, Stuart McMillan. Thank you. The Scottish Government, what plans it has for health service delivery in the west of Scotland? Cabinet Secretary Shona Robson. I expect all boards in Scotland to plan and provide healthcare services of the highest quality consistent with national policy frameworks and guidelines for the benefit of their local communities. Stuart McMillan. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for the response and uh, I'm aware that uh, there has been some discussion in recent times about the, the fabric of some of the health facilities in the Inverclyde Local Authority area and I'd uh, be grateful if the Cabinet Secretary can tell me uh, what capital investment projects have the Scottish Government uh, invested in in Inverclyde over the last 12 months and what it plans to do over the next three years. Cabinet Secretary. Um, I can say to the member that uh, the business case for the adult and older people's continuing care mental health accommodation project has been in development over recent months and the project is due to begin construction this year, due for completion in 2016. This £6.5 million project will re-provide NHS continuing care beds currently at Ravenscraig Hospital. The project will deliver 30 older people's continuing care beds and 12 adult continuing care beds in a purpose-built new facility. The new building will allow for local flexibility and provide a platform for integrated service delivery, as well as being fit for purpose in terms of patient care and experience. And the project will meet current and future needs of Inverclyde residents with significant mental health needs who have previously uh, been in NHS continuing care wards. Thank you. Jack Bailey. 
The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that acute services are delivered south of the river at the REH in Paisley for residents of Dumbarton, Vale of Leven and Helensburgh, and any understanding of geography um, knows that this is quite a challenge. The local ambition is to have services, including A&E, delivered north of the river using the Golden Jubilee and the Vale of Leven Hospital. Does she agree that with the advent of the new South Glasgow Hospital that we need to think about patient flow across the whole of Greater Glasgow and Clyde? And would the Cabinet Secretary meet a delegation from my local area to discuss how we begin to optimise health services in the area. Cabinet Secretary. I am aware there's been previous discussions uh, on this matter. I think patient flow is important and uh, I think we have to recognise that patients flow uh, above and beyond health board boundaries um, uh, that are sometimes uh, you know, there because of, of historic reasons and, and I think we have to recognise uh, that uh, more. I'm very happy to meet with uh, Jackie Bailey and the delegation to discuss this further and I'm sure we can get that organised uh, as quickly as possible. John Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware of the deteriorating A&E waiting times for NHS, Ayrshire and Arran hospitals announced yesterday. One in five of my constituents is now having to wait longer than the four-hour waiting time. How is NHS Ayrshire and Arran, with her help, going to address this deteriorating situation? Cabinet Secretary. Um, can I say that uh, there is a challenge among the, the West of Scotland boards on a &E, e performance and uh, John Scott may have heard uh, me say yesterday that there are very clear requirements to be made. Part of the reason for the pressure on the system in the West of Scotland is the acuity of illness and the sheer numbers of people who have been turning up and unprecedented levels of admission uh, in West of Scotland hospitals. But there is absolutely a requirement for those hospitals to have uh, the, the resilience to be able to cope with surges in demand. So uh, all of those boards, Ayrshire and Arran included, now have an action plan around the improvements required at the front door of the hospital but also at the back door of the hospital to make sure that issues like delayed discharge are dealt with, patient flow is enhanced, things like better use of uh, discharge lounges and all of the things you would expect that are best practice to make sure that patients are seen within the four hours are put in place and I can keep John Scott updated about progress on that. Thank you Cabinet Secretary. My apologies to the other members who wanted to ask supplementaries but I need to make some progress. Question number three, Patricia Ferguson. To ask the Scottish Government how many referrals of children and adolescents with mental health issues to specialist child and adolescent mental health services have been rejected by those services in the last quarter. Minister Jamie Hepburn. For the period October 2014 to December 2014, there were 7,640 referrals made to CAMS, of which 1,425 were rejected. Where a referral does not meet the criteria for CAMS, we would expect the service to signpost the child or young person to the appropriate service. Further details can be found in the CAMS Waiting Times publication, which were published by ISD on the 24th of February, covering the period October 2014 to December 2014. Patricia Ferguson. I thank the Minister for that answer. Does the Minister believe that 1,400 or almost 20 per cent of all referrals, mainly coming from hard-pressed GPs, which were rejected by CAMS in the last quarter, were appropriate? And does he know the outcome for the children and young people who were rejected? And if not, will he today make a commitment to Scotland's young people that he will commission urgent research to provide them, their families and this Parliament with the reassurance that the outcomes were good and that the huge variation in the number of rejected referrals between health boards was for genuine and appropriate clinical reasons. Minister. Well, I, I thank Patricia Ferguson for uh, the supplementary question. She will, of course, appreciate I cannot uh, second-guess the clinical judgment of those uh, experts, experts working uh, in uh, the uh, field. I would, of course, observe there could be a number of reasons a referral uh, may be rejected by uh, 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 a CAM services such as the referral not meet, uh, meeting its criteria. Uh, I would also observe that the number of uh, rejections mirrors uh, the increase in the number of referrals and the number of children and young people being seen by CAMs uh, as well. I think it's important to place uh, the figures in uh, that context. We've seen a significant increase in referrals uh, from 4,734 in June 2012 uh, to 7,640 in December uh, 2014. So that context is, uh, of course, important. And I would uh, again reiterate the point that where a referral does not meet uh, the criteria, we would expect uh, children and young people to be signposted to the correct service, presiding officer. Very briefly, please, Mary Scanlon. 
How can the Scottish Government ensure that early intervention and prevention work in mental health is not lost as resources become more focused on children who require substantial or urgent mental health support? Minister. Well, of course, we uh, support a, a holistic approach. I think uh, a, a range of these measures uh, are important. I still think uh, that uh, the uh, CAMS plays a very important uh, role. And again, I make the point that uh, where uh, CAMS is not appropriate, then uh, children young people who have been referred there should be signposted to alternative uh, means of support. Question number four, Tavish Scott. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government for what reason the 2015-16 funding for NHS Shetland is 2% below the 2015-16 NHS Scotland Resource Allocation Committee target allocation. Cabinet Secretary. Each year, ISD review the NRAC target share allocations for territorial health boards, and on the 24th of February, they published their revision for 2015-16. For 2015-16, NHS Shetland will be receiving a total resource budget uplift of 3.1 per cent, an increase substantially above inflation, having previously increased by 2.4 per cent in 2014-15. I'm sure that Tavish Scott will, of course, welcome uh, this uh, resource. It should be noted that our practice this year is not different to previous years, owing to the publication timing of the shares in February. In previous years, we've used this publication to inform the shares for the next financial year. As part of the budget setting process for 2016-17, we will maintain our commitment to continue to ensure that no board is further than 1% from NRAC parity and will provide additional parity funding to any board that falls further behind that 1% parity as part of this process. Tavish Scott. I'm grateful for that answer. Does that mean that uh, in this year the Cabinet Secretary will find ways to uh, improve on the financial position of NHS Shetland because it's 2.1%, not 1% uh, in the, on the figures that she's produced? And that means, as she'll know, that £900,000 uh, less funding is coming to NHS Shetland than should otherwise be the case. Wouldn't she recognise that, given the staff vacancies in a number of key areas, we would be very welcome to have those additional resources. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I have already uh, said that um, the, the, the resource that NHS Shetland uh, is getting has increased by 5.9% in real terms. You will be aware that this record level investment in NHS Shetland has helped the board to increase their staffing by over 20% under this government to a record high. But to be very clear about this, all boards through the funding that was announced brought, were brought within 1% of parity. And what I'm saying to the member is for 2016-17, the additional resource through the budget will maintain that position of all boards being within 1% of parity. And I'm sure that's something the member will welcome. Question number five, Willie Coffey. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how it supports participation in sport by disabled people in the Kilmarnock and Hedden Valley constituency. Jamie Hepburn. The Government is clear that everyone should be able to participate in, in and enjoy sport, whoever they are and whatever their background. That is why, through Sports Scotland, we are investing £642,000 in this financial year in Scottish disability sport to improve pathways into sport for our athletes with a disability and increase participation through Scottish Disability Sports local branch, Ayrshire Sports Ability, the area benefits from a growing number of grassroots programmes, allowing young people to take part in mainstream sport and develop local participation opportunities. Willie Coffey. I thank the Minister for that answer. He is familiar, of course, with some of the fine work going on in Kilmarnock and Irvine Valley to encourage people with a disability to take up sport. As well as disabled badminton and cycling clubs, we have the clan, whom the Minister met recently in Parliament, who, and who are a local rugby team who encourage people with disabilities to train and play alongside non-disabled players. Would the Minister join with me in congratulating those groups? And perhaps, from the Irish permit, would he be able to come and see for himself the wonderful impact that this kind of participation has for disabled people in my community? Minister? Well, let me, uh, first of all, uh, agree and uh, join with uh, Willie Coffey in acknowledging the uh, uh, range of uh, programmes that have been delivered in Comarca and Valley. Of course, uh, I would be very delighted to come and uh, visit to see uh, that for first hand. I uh, am uh, very encouraged in particular by the work being delivered by uh, the clan, which uh, Mr Coffey uh, mentioned as he mentioned uh, uh, it was at uh, the Scottish Rugby Union's recent parliamentary reception, as was he, and I was uh, greatly uh, impressed by the presentation that we had uh, about the work <laughs> uh, of uh, the clan. I think it is a great uh, concept promoting equality, diversity and social uh, inclusion uh, through participation in the game, and they are very much to be commended for their efforts. 
Many thanks. Question number six, Alec Johnson. To ask the Scottish Government what action it will take in the light of NHS Grampy in missing the target for treating 90 per cent of patients within 18 weeks. Cabinet Secretary. NHS Grampian is receiving additional funding of £49.1 million in 2015 16, including £29 million of NRAC parity funding. This uplift, uplift of 6.3% is the largest uplift of any mainline territorial board and is 4.9% above inflation. In addition, the board will receive £2.8 million to tackle delayed discharge in 2015 16. The Board is utilising funding from the Budget by investing £5 million of the Budget uplift to deliver the waiting times guarantee and standards during 15-16. Scottish Government is also providing support to the Board to improve their demand, queuing and capacity planning processes. This will help the Board ensure that they put in place the necessary capacity to deliver all waiting time standards and guarantees for the people of Grampian in the future. Alec Johnson. I am extremely interested in the way in which the Minister chose to answer that question, dealing first with the funding issue. Is that a, a clear statement by the Minister that she believes that the problems associated with Gramp NHS Grampian are as a result of serious chronic underfunding? Uh, and why did it take her government eight years in office to realise it was not adequately funding health care in the North East? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, th I think performance issues are uh, not just about funding. I think they're about the way you organise your services and the way you deliver your services. And what I am very impressed with is the new leadership team at NHS Grampian, with the chair and the chief executive very, very focused on the task in hand, which is already beginning to deliver very uh, impressive and uh, sustained improvement. And I'm hoping that's something that the member will welcome. Richard Simpson. Um, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, now that Grampian has had its comprehensive review, and in light of the deteriorating A&E waiting times in other areas, uh, does, she, does she still not concede that the Royal College of Nursing and others who have called for a whole system review should now be heeded, including looking at all unplanned and emergency care from demand issues through NHS 24, GP, out of hours, minor and major accidents, emergency and the planned trauma centres? and acute assessment and clinical decision units, doing it as a comprehensive mechanism rather than the, the piecemeal or what I've called whack-a-mole approach that she's adopting. Cabinet Secretary. Well, it's a pity in all of that, Richard Simpson, didn't see uh, the need to thank the staff of NHS Fourth Valley, who have delivered a 96.2% uh, of A&E patients seen within four hours. I think it would have been a good opportunity for Richard Simpson to thank the staff in the area that he represents for that very impressive performance. In terms of the wider issues that he mentions, uh, I am very, very clear that there are issues that the, the service needs to look at, not just at the front door of the hospital, Hospital, which is why, of course, we've got the six essential actions through the collaborative to improve the way the front door of our hospitals operates, but, of course, tackling delayed discharge, which is why I've put £100 million into the system, why we have integrated health and social care, also why we're looking at um, the out-of-hours services to make sure that that is sustainable. I think uh, Richard uh, Simpson would, would do well to welcome some of these initiatives because it's going to improve the care of our patients. Question number seven, Malcolm Chisholm. Scottish Government, what action it is taking to improve the provision of perinatal mental health services? Minister Jamie Hepburn. The NHS Scotland keeps under review the range of community and specialist services it delivers to meet the needs of women experiencing perinatal mental illness. The aim is to identify quickly those at risk and ensure access to appropriate and timely care, treatment and support. Malcolm Chisholm. Uh, I welcome the fact that there is a specialist peri uh, perinatal community uh, team in NHS uh, Lothian, but uh, is it not the case that in many parts of Scotland there is no specialist service available and that uh, women are telling us that in many cases they receive very little help at all when facing this very serious mental health problem. Does the Minister uh, agree that this is a, a very serious problem with profound consequences for a large number of women and children in Scotland and does he accept that there is a postcode lottery of care when it comes to perinatal mental health services? Minister. Well of course uh, the 2012 uh, signed national uh, clinical uh, guideline for health professionals on uh, perinatal mood disorders provides recommendations based on current evidence for best practice in the management of uh, antenatal and postnatal mood and anxiety uh, disorders. The guideline covers uh, prediction, detection and prevention, as well as uh, management in both primary uh, and secondary care. And, uh, this uh, government has uh, published uh, guidance on the organisation and accommodation services for mothers suffering from a, a perinatal uh, mental illness. And we would certainly expect NHS uh, boards to take account of this and uh, other 
available guidance in the delivery of their local services. Thank you. Question number eight, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the future of the Glasgow Centre for Integrative Care and its funding arrangements. Minister Maureen Watt. The Centre for Integrative Care will continue to provide services to meet the needs of patients from across Scotland. Funding will continue to be provided by NHS boards who refer, patient, refer patients to the centre. Claudia Beamish. I thank the Minister for her answer. And I would like to highlight concerns of constituents regarding the withdrawal, withdrawal of homeopathic services in Lanarkshire and Lothian. NHS Lanarkshire will stop referring new patients at the end of the month and the current patients will be the last. Can the Minister clarify whether the Health Services Council was involved in the monitoring of the consultation? And also, as the CIC offers a wide range of services, including prescribing of homeopathic medicines, yoga, mindfulness, and self-management programs, which can be hugely beneficial to people with mental health issues and stress issues, is the Scottish Government in any way considering a more centralised form of funding for this centre? Minister. Well, as I said, um, the uh, Scottish Government uh, CIC is already recognised by the Scottish Government NHS boards, patients and the public as a national resource. And Claudia Beamish is quite right to highlight that it's not only homeopathy that's uh, provided at CIC, but also a wide range of other services. Um, we are quite content that the boards who have stopped referring for homeopathy only uh, have uh, undertaken the public <coughs> consultation and uh, carried out the review uh, in the proper uh, manner. But as I said, there are no uh, plans to close CIC. We see it as having a role for patients across Scotland. Thank you. Question number nine, Roger Campbell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what the uptake of the shingles vaccine has been by 70 to 79 year olds since September 2013. Minister Maureen Watt. The shingles herpes zoster programme was introduced in 2013 and is being offered to those aged 70 to 79 in a phased programme over the next few years, comprising both a routine and a catch up element each year. In the first year of the programme, which ran from the 1st of September 2013 to the 31st of August 2014, the vaccine was offered to those aged 70 routinely and those aged 79 by catch-up. Uptake rates were for 70-year-olds uh, 59.7% and 79-year-olds 55.6%. In 2014-15, vaccine was offered to those aged 70 routinely and those aged 78 and 79 through catch-up. Uptake rates are not yet available. However, provisional data suggests that up to January 2015, uptake is higher than the same time last year and is still likely to rise. Roger Campbell. I am grateful to the Minister for that answer uh, and the encouraging statistics, but how can she encourage further uptake? Minister. Um, well, those eligible for a vaccine receive a letter from their GP practice inviting them to attend for immunisation. Uh, GPs can, if they wish, offer the shingles vaccine at the same time as the seasonal flu vaccine. And there's also a, a poster and a leaflet uh, available to promote the programme and to help uptake rates. But as I said in my previous answer, uptake rates are rising and we are confident that they will continue in an upward trend. Nanette. Thank you. Given that there are some 7,000 people in Scotland aged 70 and above who are affected with shingles, would the Minister agree with me that the vaccine should be made available at the earliest opportunity for all people in that age bracket from 70 to 79, after which I understand it is less effective? Can she also, I think she has told us a bit about the, the rollout of the, of the vaccine. Will she confirm that the, the catch-up really will be starting at 79 and working down until it presumably meets starting age 79, working down 78 so on, until it, it meets the, the upwards file. How, how long is, is that actually going to take? And can it be speeded up? Minister. Um, I'm not able to do the maths right away, but uh, through both the routine moving up the way and the, co and the catch up moving down the way, um, it should be uh, within the next few years that everybody in that age cohort <coughs> is covered. Thank you. And a question number 10, Jim Hume. The Scottish Government what measures it is taking to increase the training, recruitment and retention of mental health officers across children and adolescent mental health services. Minister Jamie Hepburn. Local authorities have a legal duty to appoint a sufficient number of mental health officers to discharge functions under the relevant legislation. They must decide 
on the number of mental health officers appointed in their area, take into account local needs and circumstances. The Scottish Social Service Council's latest mental health officers report indicates a 39 per cent increase in admissions to mental health officer award programmes in 2013-14. Minister, for, for that answer. In 2012, the Scottish Government removed a bursary given to each trainee of educational psychology that resulted in a 70% drop in applications for such courses. Uh, the Scottish Children's Services Coalition noted that that, coupled with a quarter of educational psychologists retiring in the next four years, plus an identification of more than a doubling of the number of children identified as having support needs, will leave a major gap in the profession. Their words. How does the Government plan to address the deficit of educational psychologists at a time when need for them is increasing and fulfil the promises of addressing children and adolescent mental health services? Minister. Well, of course, I think I might need to, first of all, write to Mr Hume to draw the distinction between mental health officers and educational psychologists. Uh, President officer, uh, what we would of course expect is uh, that we will uh, work very closely with educational institutions to make sure that we always have uh, a steady and constant and necessary supply of uh, uh, health professionals across the uh, whole range of the National Health Service. Many thanks. Question number 11, David Torrance. To ask the Scottish Government what additional support has given NHS Fife to help improve its performance. Cabinet Secretary. <coughs> An additional £12.43 million has been allocated to NHS Five. From this, £2.1 million will be allocated in 2015-16 to alleviate drug pressures. And the Five Partnership will receive £6.73 million over the next three years, which will go towards developing local community services that will help to reduce unnecessary admissions and ensure timely discharge from hospital. David Torrance. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer. Can the Cabinet Secretary tell me how much it is costing NHS Five per year? to pay for the new PPP Victoria Hospital, which was built under the last Labour government, and do large repayments, com repayment commitments seriously impact on frontline services? Cabinet Secretary. The uh, forecast unitary charge for the Victoria Hospital PFI contract is uh, £21.7 uh, million. Pounds. Uh, PFI costs are a considerable uh, burden on the system. I can tell the member that PFI contracts uh, will cost the, the health service £235 million pounds, uh, in 2015-16. Uh, obviously, um, NHS Fife, like other boards, uh, is funded according to the NRAC formula, and uh, indeed, under the NRAC formula, uh, they, have, uh, um, it, they have had a, a significant uh, uplift. Um, Fife's budget has increased by £145.9 million from 2006-07 to 2015-16. So, although there are um, all, obviously always pressures on the system, um, we would expect NHS Fife to use that resource to improve uh, patient care. Thank you. Question number 12, James Dornan. Thank you, Convener. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government when it last met representatives of NHS, Greater Glasgow and Clyde, and what issues were discussed. Cabinet Secretary. Ministers and government officials regularly meet with representatives of all boards, including NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, to discuss matters of importance to local people. James Dornan. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Uh, th 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 I noticed that the South, South University Hospital has been mentioned a couple of times already today. Uh, and although there are uh, issues still to be dealt with, and along with my Glasgow colleagues, we've written to the Health Board to get clarification on that. We do have to accept that the, the, the fact that it's been delivered before schedule and under budget is one of the great achievements of the Government. Could the Cabinet Secretary give me further information on what final steps are in place to ensure a smooth opening of the hospital in a couple of months' time that will benefit patients, visitors and staff? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I'm happy to confirm to the member that the £842 million project for the new uh, South Glasgow Hospital remains on time and on budget. Work is now underway to equip and test the new facilities, which will provide the, the gold standard of co-locating state-of-the-art adult children and maternity services and to train staff ahead of the migration of clinical services between late April and June. This is, of course, a massive logistical undertaking which the Health Board has been planning for over a number of years. They have assured me that they have robust plans and contingency measures in place to ensure the effective migration of services whilst continuing to deliver high-quality services for the benefit of patients. 
Uh, the government has been and will remain in close touch with the board at this important, as this important work is taken forward over the next few weeks. Thank you. Question number 13, Sandra White. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the proposed parking provision and transport links for staff and visitors at the new Southside Hospital. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, further to uh, my previous answers, the, the Scottish Government uh, arranged a, a meeting uh, on the 2nd of March, which, as I said, was rep uh, attended by representatives of all of the partners who are all working very closely to ensure that suitable travel and parking arrangements uh, are uh, in place. The attendees agreed to pursue plans for the temporary car park to cover the period until the third multi-storey car park opens and to continue to provide strong support to staff, patients and visitors to the campus in making appropriate travel arrangements. Support measures put in place include changing shift patterns for staff to make public transport use easier, putting further bus services in place and the provision of specific upcoming functionality in the widely used Travel Line app to help users reach key NHS locations beginning with the new hospital campus. Sandra White. Th 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 thank the Cabinet, Cabinet Secretary for his reply and also for the previous indication regarding parking spaces. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that the, the Western Infirmary and obviously York Hill Hospital in my constituency will close and move on to the new Southside Hospital. So it is imperative that we get proper transport links there. I note in regard to the temporary spaces and perhaps the, the parking spaces are, you know, a parking uh, residential. Uh, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary if there was a, any indication that we need more parking spaces, would that be indicative in Glasgow City Council giving that permission? And it's also came to our note that there is a development to look at a bridge to link Govan and Partick at the moment. And I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary would agree with me if that was to go ahead, that would be beneficial and a positive move for the people, particularly from Cab my side Cabinet of the river. Cabinet Secretary, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think, I think the development of a bridge would, would be helpful and uh, that's something uh, we would uh, want to uh, keep a, a, a close eye on as that development goes forward, although I think it is in very early stages. The planned uh, car parking provision at the, the new hospitals uh, of 3,500 spaces is already in line with the maximum uh, provision allowed by the planning approval for the development. Any further car parking would therefore be subject to planning applications to Glasgow City Council. Uh, as uh, the member is aware, a planning application has been made for the 600 temporary spaces uh, until the third multi-storey opens next year, and this is currently being considered by the Council. Very briefly, Bruce Crawford. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, many people in my southern part of my constituency, Drimmon and Strathendrick area, will be travelling to this new hospital. There are no useful transport, public transport links from this area into the hospital. I just wonder whether particular cognizance could be given to the challenging issues that they face by way of travel to the new hospital, and we could be asked the board to look at the area in particular. Briefly, please, Cabinet Secretary. Yep, I will ask the board to uh, write to the member and to make him aware of what uh, provisions are being put in place. Many thanks. Question 14, Linda Fabiani. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met NHS Lanarkshire. Cabinet Secretary. Ministers and government officials regularly meet with representatives from all health boards, including NHS Lanarkshire. Uh, Linda Fabiani. Uh, thank you. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary to continue dialogue with NHS Lanarkshire about soft ancillary services at Hairmeyer's Hospital? And could I also ask that she meets regularly and has discussion with Unison, uh, who have been carrying out a petition on behalf of bringing this into public service? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I thank uh, Linda Fabiani for her ongoing interest uh, in this matter. Uh, she will be aware, obviously, that um, the uh, Scottish Futures Trust have carried out uh, some work around uh, NHS Lanarkshire's um, uh, procedures and process around the contracts. Um, that uh, report uh, will be, has, has been seen by the board and will be discussed by the board uh, later uh, this month. I met with Unison on Monday to uh, discuss that and what uh, there was a, a number of further actions that have um, emanated from that meeting. We also are, uh, have been in touch with NHS Lanarkshire to ensure that Unison are very much involved in the discussions and in the discussion of the report and the decision making around this later this month. 
The issues are very complex, and of course, the contracts that were issued were contracts that would never, ever be issued, and of course, wouldn't be in the light of the action this government took in 2008 to prevent uh, soft FM services being contracted out in the future. These are contracts, unfortunately, that we have inherited. I'm calling question 15, but we must be very brief. Jamie McGregor. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government how it supports the provision of locally accessible maternity scanning services in the Highlands and Islands. Mort. While the Scottish Government provides the policies, framework and resources for high quality health care in Scotland, it is for each NHS board to decide how best to deliver services to meet the needs of the population. The NHS is committed to providing services as close to home as possible, but also needs to ensure that these services are safe and provided by appropriately trained and skilled workforce. Briefly, Jamie McGregor. Uh, notwithstanding NHS Highlands' welcome recent announcement, that it hopes to reintroduce local maternity scanning services in Argyll and Butte from late 2016. Does the Minister understand the frustration and concern of my mother-to-be constituents who since 2013 have had to make inconvenient, time-consuming and stressful journeys to hospitals in the Glasgow, Greenock or Paisley for the maternity scans? Uh, and as a father whose wife previously used the local services four you times... Along, please. What guarantee can the Minister give that funding will be available for local scans in Campbelltown, Danoon, Eiley, Loch, Gilped, Oban and Rothsey? Minister, as briefly as possible, please. Yeah, I, I agree with the member that it is not uh, satisfactory that, that uh, mothers-to-be have to travel uh, so far out with the area. But uh, like him, I am pleased that NHS Highland has agreed that services should be uh, resumed locally and as quickly as possible. Thank you, Minister. That concludes question time and brings us to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 12491 in the name of